Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for the privilege of getting to address you today, and I love you all, and I thank you for praying for me. And I'm, I'm standing up here today largely because of uh, answers to prayers. People prayed for me for a long, long time before I, before I came to know the Lord, and I'm so thankful. Oh, I'm so thankful. Um, he reached out, and I'm going to share a little bit about my personal testimony as we go on. But before we, before we even begin, let's go to Him. My, my sincere prayer is that every heart here in this room will be wide open to the dealings of the Lord. That we'll each hear Him speak to us personally. Uh, I'm only a messenger. He's the one we all need to know, okay? Our Heavenly Father, we all set our eyes upon you this morning. We look to you. We ask that your Holy Spirit be active in our hearts today. Prepare our hearts. Open our hearts. Uh, fill us, Lord, with your Spirit. Lord, there, I pray that not one person will leave this sanctuary without knowing they've been in your presence. We, uh, we live because of you. We want to acknowledge you as life, our life, Lord, and we thank you for all you've done for us, you're doing now, and all that you have in store for us in the future. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. All right. Walking with God, some things I've learned. Y'all been walking with God for a while? I'm a latecomer. I was 42 before I started that walk with God, and, and he brought me to himself. It was an amazing thing. I, it's more like a, I was blind, but then one day I could see. <laughs> and uh, the things that I've learned along the way uh, are priceless in value. The things the Lord shows you through his word, the things that he shows you by way of experience, places he takes you, things he allows you to uh, encounter and experiences that you have, they're priceless. I'm going to challenge everybody here, when, when you get home or get a chance, get you a sheet of paper and just um, mark it on the bottom. This is when I was born. And mark it off about every two years. And up here's where you are now. And just put down significant events that have taken place in your life, people you've met, moves you've made, maybe career paths that have changed, different things like that, and just look and see what God has been doing in your life, moving you from point A to point B to point C, and he brings you along, you know, and a lot of times you may be unaware of it. I surely was. I had no idea that God was working to bring me to a particular point in time, uh, at a particular place. <laughs> the setting, uh, he, he arranged everything to bring me to himself. And now I simply recognize it now. Back then, I didn't even know what was happening. But uh, some of the things that I've learned along the way, walking with him, let's see if I... Number one, God has created everything. Has anybody ever heard that before? <laughs> in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is such a staggering statement. Sometimes we say it without really contemplating the full depth of what's just been said there. If you can believe that verse, the rest of the scriptures will be easy to, to believe. That's a big one there. God created. Uh, he has a purpose in all that he does. And uh, I hope to, to sort of reveal some of that purpose here as we go forward. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a hint. He loves you dearly. He loves you. He does much of what he does for you. You ever think about that? Now, if the love of a father will not cause a child to delight in him, what will? You fathers, I know, who've loved your children, you, you shower them with love, you give them advantages of all kinds, you take care of them, and if there's no response on their part of love for you, I really don't know what else you can do. 
God has loved us richly. He has poured his love out upon us. And if we don't delight in him, I don't know what else can be done. But the delighting in him is something that's uh, uh, it's our responsibility, our, our place to respond. Love him with all your heart, with all your soul, mind, and strength. Love him. The, uh, I'm not very knowledgeable on a lot of the things in the scripture. It's a pretty big book, about 2,000 pages, lots of information. I know he loves me. I know he loves me. And that uh, seems to be uh, probably the most important thing I could glean from that book is that he loves me. There's a few other things like he's all powerful. He's able to create the heavens and the earth here. Just take a look at that. Have you ever made anything? <laughs> uh, that's just one little tiny section of this universe. Just one little solar system there. And, uh, and those stars are infinite in number. Well, maybe not infinite. I can't count them. <laughs> but uh, our God has made that. And it was no problem for him to create all these things. And he sustains them daily. He has them right where he wants them. And they're all moving. I don't know how he arranges that, you know, but he's got all things in order up there. Everything's circling. Uh, there may be some uh, astronomers here who know a lot more about it than I do, but I can just look up there and, and thank God, you know. Well, that's on the, out there in the big universe. Here on planet Earth, he's made some pretty, pretty amazing sights, too. I could show you, you know, slides all day on that, but just to sample a couple here. He's uh, intimately related with his entire creation. He knows the stars by name. He knows every plant, every animal. He knows when a sparrow falls. He knows all things about everything that he's made. And he knows you. He knows how many hairs are on our heads. You know, he knows <laughs> what we feel and what we're thinking. He knows all about us. He created everything including us. You know, you and I were the crowning creation. He created all these other things before he created man. Okay? It's as if he created all those things for man. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living person. You know, folks, I can't imagine that moment, but God formed Adam of the dust of the ground. And then, so you have a lifeless body. Lifeless body. God's just made it. And God himself breathes the breath of life into Adam's nostrils. And Adam opens his eyes, and he's looking into the face of his creator. He's just become a living soul. He's just been brought into existence. He had not uh, a lot to do with that, if you notice. He's the recipient of God's grace. He's been brought into existence by God. He's been created, and he's been given life. He's been given a wonderful mind, the opportunity to, to choose many things. He's going to be able to make choices. In verse 8 there, the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. God placed him where he so desired. Uh, do you think God still does things like that today? Do you think you might be in Grassy Valley Baptist Church this morning by divine design? I do. I didn't know that most of my life. I didn't understand that. I thought I was just making my own way through this life. But I've come to understand someone else is guiding my path. Someone else is guiding me, and I, I finally come to recognize it. I'm so, so very thankful that I know now. I didn't know all that before. Existence and life. We exist only because God made us. There's a great truth in that. And we're alive because God gave us life. That's a great kindness, isn't it? 
You know, I tell my mom all the time, thank you, mom, for bringing me into this world. Thank you, dad. He's passed away now, but I thank mom and dad that I'm here. You know, I couldn't figure out how to find this place without them. They brought me here. <laughs> and God brought them here. And if you trace this all the way back to Adam, it was God who brought him here and gave him life and existence and all things. It's really good that we, we go back and think on that sometimes. It really, really helped me to learn this when I, when I began to realize there's, there's a God who's sovereign over all and he's created a number of things. He's letting us experience many of these things. He lets us, he lets us have the life and the curiosity to experience many things, but that's, that's all a gift from God. And uh, when you come to full grips with that, when it, when it becomes a reality to you, it'll change your life. It'll change many things. Number two, another thing I've learned is uh, walking with Christ is there is an enemy. Anybody met the enemy? <laughs> uh, if you, <laughs> he's real. He, he's real. I, I didn't know him either. He uh, had a pretty good grip on me for the longest time. And Jesus uh, describes him here in John 10.10, 10, the thief. He calls him a thief. That's a pretty good characterization. This is Jesus. He knows him well. He knows the enemy, and he is a thief. He will steal your life, your children, your finances, your joy, you name it. If it's dear to you, he'll try to steal it, okay? And he's pretty good at what he does. He's stolen a lot from a lot of people. He comes to kill, maim, destroy. He's very active in our world today. He is stealing. He is killing and destroying everything he can. He really is. And Jesus contrasts himself to this thief here. He says, I came so that they would have life and have it abundantly. The abundant life. <laughs> he's, he's come to give us uh, a kind of life that's beyond anything this world uh, has ever known. It's a life free of the enemy, free of sin, free of all the consequences of sin. And he has come to seek us and to save us. He's brought this out. I'm, uh, I'm one who he found. He found me. I can't take any credit whatsoever for being found. He sought me and found me. I'm, I'm amazed at that. I don't know what in the world he would want with me, but he wanted me for some reason. And I'm so thankful that he does. Now, he wants you. I don't have the words to tell you how badly he wants you. He wants you to be his child. He wants you to be with him for eternity, to enjoy this abundant life. Many of us will receive that abundant life and enjoy it. Sadly, some will not. I wonder what would characterize those that did not. What do you think? I'm going to give you one big... Uh, reason from scripture unbelief just simply not believing that God is who he says he is or not believing these words from scripture Jesus just told us right there I came so that they would have life and have it abundantly he intends to fulfill his end people who don't believe him miss out okay all right Man, Adam, Eve, way back there, they started out right. I mean, can you imagine that environment there, living in the Garden of Eden with God, day in and day out, everything you need at your fingertips, and God, if you're not sure about anything, here's God, let's go talk to him, let's ask him. He's right here, he's coming to walk with us in the cool of the day. I don't know how it could have been any better. It was amazing. Uh, they started out right, but then they went wrong. An enemy, a deceiver came along, and uh, he did something that he's still doing today. He told a lie. He lied to people. He's good at that. Very good. Now, the, the person who's telling the lies is, is uh, terrible, I'll be honest with you. But you don't really get hurt 
by the lies unless you really and truly believe it yourself. Has anybody ever told you a lie? Anybody? I'm sure, some, I'm sure you've been lied to. They're, they're especially painful when you, when you believe it and then you discover later, oh no, that was a lie. This is not the vehicle I thought it was. <laughs> These are, this is not the house I thought it was going to be. The, the, you, you, you go ahead and act on the things they told you which were not true and then you suffer the consequences. So this enemy of God has lied to us about God. He's lied to us about the importance of obeying God and he, he's, he's done everything in the world to make us think we don't need God. Uh, we do, and we absolutely need to obey God. We need Him desperately. Our lives came from Him. Just out of sheer gratitude for that, we should be obedient to Him. We should be faithful. Well, this enemy, this deceiver's been active, and he's still going strong. The problem there is point number two, people believed the lies. I think he, he talked to Adam something like, or to Eve, um, you may go ahead and eat this fruit. I know God's forbidden it. You're not supposed to eat it. But you won't surely die when you partake of it. That's a direct contradiction to what God says. You will not surely die. And you will become like God. What a tempting offer. He's, he took the penalty off the table, the, the penalty, the consequence of death. He removed that and uh, sweetened it, now you're going to be like God. You won't need him anymore. You can do what you want. What a lie. People are still buying that one today. Now the serpent was more cunning than any animal of the field which the Lord God had made. He's still quite cunning. And he said to the woman, has God really said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Notice how he approaches her has God really said? You know, one thing about God, He says what He means, and He means what He says. You and I, I really enjoy that. I can read what God says, and I don't have to go any further. That's the truth. I have the truth when I read God's Word. We can rely on it, can't we? We can trust what God says. The serpent's the one that tries to get you to doubt. Did Jesus say he was coming to seek and to save the lost? Did he want to provide us with the abundant life? Over and over through these Gospels, Pastor Mark's taken us through the Gospel of John. You're going to see these, uh, these attempts at Jesus to let the people know why he's here, to let the people know who he is. And he's going he's to do it verbally. He's going to do it through the miracles. He's going to do it through the life that he lives. He's going to live a sinless life right in front of them. And then he's going all the way through the cross. He's going to pay the penalty for their sins with his, his death on the cross, his shed blood. And he's, he's not just talking. He's doing and showing and illustrating and everything. It's all right there. And still, many didn't believe. Still. So, has God really said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? That's how he began the process there of deception. Well, from start to finish, if we start out wrong, and um, we have, we've started out wrong by, kind of, by believing lies of the enemy. If we continue wrong, just keep on doing that. Keep disregarding the truth that God, said, that God shows us in his word. Just keep disregarding it. Then we finish wrong. That's wrong. It is not God's will that any should perish. That lake of fire is for fallen angels. It's not God's will that any of us enter therein. He's done everything necessary to prevent that. Everything. Well, there is a course correction that's possible. Okay? We do start out wrong. But if we recognize that we are wrong. I'll never forget the moment I discovered I was wrong, had been my entire life. It was like revealed to me 
as I simply read John's Gospel. Uh, if you don't think you're wrong or you're not sure, let me challenge you to read the Gospel of John. Just simply read it. I might challenge you to read Exodus chapter 22, read the Ten Commandments. Just see where you stand. I didn't have any idea where I stood. I didn't know who my Creator was. I didn't know His laws. I didn't know the Savior. I didn't know anything. I started out wrong, and uh, one and a half trips through the Gospel of John, I had one of those moments where everything fell into place. I became aware of who Jesus is. I knew He was there with me at that precise moment in my mom's living room. I knew that. And I knew I was wrong. I was absolutely terrified. I thought my next stop was that lake of fire there. We recognize we're wrong. Here's what the, the Lord prescribes for us. Believe truth. Believe Jesus Christ. Believe and receive the eternal life that He so freely offers us. Do you know it, it gives Him pleasure to give you eternal life as a gift? How, how could anybody turn that down? It, it just baffles me. It's unbelief that it's available or reality or unbelief about who He is. But the, uh, the, the solution is to believe the truth and then receive the eternal life. In John 5, 24, Jesus, again, speaking, He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. You can pass out of death into life before you walk out that door today. Right here, it's not a place that, uh, that matters, it's what's going on inside you. You believe with your heart. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. This is God's uh, remedy for each and every one of us there. Now God is always working. God the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, it's active and living. When you sit down with the Bible and you read it, God's speaking to you. And the Holy Spirit, Carol and I just prayed before the service that the Holy Spirit would open hearts to receive. He opens our hearts and can grant us faith. He can grant us repentance. He can show us this is right. Does anyone sense that you're hearing some truth here today? Do you know deep down inside you're hearing truth? That would be the Holy Spirit at work. When you know, oh my goodness, this is true. That's what happened to me back in 1998, January the 18th, about 4.30. <laughs> I was reading the Gospel of John and boom, all of a sudden, oh my, this is true. This is all true. I know it's true. You know, I believed. I didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. I didn't know who he was or how he worked or anything, but he had already been working on me to open these things up to me. I was able to believe because he opened my eyes. He allowed me to. I didn't know that, but uh, I just knew I'm a believer. I, I didn't really know. I'm still having a hard time explaining it, you know, but, but something happened to me that day. Well, God is working right now in Grassy Valley right here, and if you're watching us on the Internet, he's working there too. There's no place where he's not working, okay? He's at work. All this is his, the entire universe, this world, everything belongs to him. And it's still his desire that all people come to faith in Christ. So wherever you may be this morning, uh, he's, he wants you. He wants your heart. You may not know the Holy Spirit, okay? You may not. But he knows you. Okay? How does that feel to be known by God? Known by God the Holy Spirit and that and the loves you, loves you. Well, now God also works through people and places and things. Have you ever had someone that 
influenced you towards Christ? A person with a kind word or a, a gospel tract or maybe someone prayed for you? If you search back through your life, you're going to find many occasions where God's placed people in your life, specific people at particular times. He does that, and sometimes it's, you, he may have you in a particular place. And there's all manner of things that he can use to reach out to us. Um, I'm going to use just a few quick examples from the book of Jonah just to show you how God is intimately related with even the tiniest of details. Just as I showed you the solar system there and the, and the planet Earth there for a few pictures, he's also intimately involved in the smallest things. He can hurl a great wind on the sea and create a, a massive storm. God can cause a storm right there in that ship that Jonah was in where he was rebelling against God. He can do that. Well, when the sailors on Jonah's boat decided to cast lots to try to figure out who's disobeying their God, God can cause the outcome of that lot to point out Jonah. <laughs> can you imagine? God uh, has power to control the outcome of sailors on a ship in a storm casting lots. That's amazing to me just to think of the precision control that he has all throughout everything. And uh, they, uh, they heard from Jonah that, well, your only solution here is to toss me overboard. And when they did, they saw the sea stopped raging. When Jonah's in the, in the water, God stops the storm. And the sailors were observant enough to notice the connection when we threw Jonah overboard, the storm stopped. I remember once I heard a sermon called, Is, is There a Jonah? in your boat. <laughs> Get ready for a storm. If somebody's rebelling against God, they're disobedient and they're in your boat, you're going to go down with the ship too unless uh, somebody deals with Jonah, okay? <laughs> uh, we don't want uh, people rebelling against God uh, in our midst, essentially, uh, unless we go to him, listen, listen, you're, you're disobeying God. Let's, let's go to them and confront them about that, you know. That'd be wise, wouldn't it? Because there's some consequences. Achan was one man that disobeyed God and brought about a lot of military defeat for the ancient nation of Israel. Uh, people that are rebelling against God and disobedient, but they're, they're trying to um, join in, will bring a lot of problems for those that are worshiping the Lord. Something to think about. I don't know. Jonah, uh, Jonah's going off by himself. Well, the Lord had appointed a great fish. Now, somewhere a long, long time before this fish was big enough to swallow Jonah, there was a fish egg somewhere. <laughs> and that little fish had to make it through all the other predators out there in the sea that didn't get gobbled up there along the way. And he grew to the right size. And then he had to be in the right location at just the right time when they tossed Jonah so that Jonah wouldn't drown. He's going to be swallowed by this fish and kept alive. So that's essentially, uh, God was able to direct traffic there with that fish under the waters. He's, can you imagine the, the ability he has to control things if he can cause a little fish to grow up and be big enough to swallow Jonah, be at the right place at the right time? And we, we take these Bible stories sometimes for granted. We don't notice all the details that are given. Uh, Esther was uh, at the right place at the right time. How did that happen? You know, there's all kinds of things when you look at those things. Saul was traveling on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. Just so happened, had an encounter with God. A Samaritan woman at a well in John 4. Jesus just stopped by. <laughs> These aren't coincidental. They may seem at first, but when you look a little deeper, you're going to see the hand of God. God himself orchestrating all these circumstances. People Places and things are all under his sovereign control. It's hard to realize that, but that's the truth. Well, he had the fish swallow Jonah. Probably gave him some indigestion, I guess. But he swallowed him. And then when it was time, the Lord commanded the fish to put Jonah out on the dry land. And he did. He did. These are amazing points when you think about it. Uh, well... 
The people of Nineveh, they heard Jonah's harsh message. He delivered a message that you're about to be destroyed. But God saw their deeds that they had turned away from their wicked way. You see how God sees what the people of Nineveh were doing. He saw their wicked ways, their wicked deeds, and then he saw when they repented. And then God determined, I'm not going to destroy these people at this time. Okay? God determines what's going to take place, whether it's destruction or salvation. All right? The Lord God, now Jonah is pretty unhappy that the people have uh, repented, to say the least. He's still sort of hoping for them to be uh, destroyed. So Jonah's sitting here fretting over things, and the Lord appointed a plant to provide a little bit of shade for Jonah in the hot sun while Jonah waits for Nineveh's destruction. <laughs> well, Jonah was loving this plant. It's sheltering from the hot sun. So Jonah didn't have anything to do with growing that plant. He was just enjoying what God had provided. And then God decided to appoint a worm. Can you imagine, how are you going to get that worm to gnaw down this plant? I've not had much success getting worms to do anything. But it's no problem for God. He can cause a worm to come along. And I think in the Bible, once he had a spider spin a web over a cave opening to protect one, uh, I believe it was David in that cave. But God can, uh, he can do amazing things. It might be a worm or a spider or a fish. There's no one out there, nothing out there that's not under his control. He appointed a worm to cut the tree down, cut the plant down, and then God appointed a scorching east wind. So Jonah got a little blast of heat to help him think. Okay. All right. God works through people, places, and things. And here's my story, the short version. I'm, I'm going to share a little bit. God actually blessed me long, long before I got here with praying grandparents and a praying mom. Now, I was not into prayer myself, uh, but my grandmother was. My mother tells me that long before her children were even grown, my grandmother would gather all her children around, pray for them, and their children that were coming in the future. She would ask God to bless her grandchildren long before her kids even had kids, okay? So that's the kind of uh, ancestry I have, I guess, and I'm fortunate to be in that line of praying people. I'm, I'm really blessed. Now, I didn't know it, and I surely didn't appreciate it, but um, my uh, aunts tell me they, they all... My grandmother and her 12 little children were living in a little cabin up next to the, uh, to the woods. And then there was a big field on this side where they had some cows. And over here's the woods right behind the house. And somehow the woods caught on fire. And it was in August. And it was a terribly hot day, not a cloud in the sky. And they didn't have homeowner's insurance or anything. But my grandmother just gathered all the kids and took them out under. There was a little tree in the middle of this big field. And she began to ask God to send rain to put out, the, uh, put out the fire in the woods so their house wouldn't burn down. And my aunt, she must have been about 13 years old when this happened. My aunt was looking up like, this isn't going to do any good. You know, there aren't any clouds in the sky. She didn't know God or the power of prayer. And my grandmother did. She began to pray, Lord. We need you to come through in this. We need you to pre please send the rain to put this fire out. We're about to lose our home. Please, Father. Do you know my aunt was looking up and there's little clouds starting to form all over the place. And then the sky got so dark. She said it was a real thunderburst. It was <laughs> an awesome rain that came and, and, and put that fire out. <laughs> my aunt was amazed and she began to be a little bit afraid of her mother because her mother could pray like that. You know, she didn't know how to, she didn't know how to explain that. But power with God is the privilege of people who know him and pray. Do you know he hears you when you pray? Do you know he cares? Do you know he can cause people to come and help you in your time of need? He most certainly can. He can send people you've never met to come and assist. 
See, he's sovereign over all these things, and he has infinite power, and his love for you is beyond, beyond measure. And uh, the appropriate response is, is essentially, come to him. Lord, I now see who you are, and I surrender. I want to give you my life. I want, to get, I, want, I want to put my life under your care. I'm glad that you care. I'm glad that you'll direct me. And so if you come to him, there's something about God that if, that if a heart appeals to him, it's, it's like a little child. I, I watch them all the time at the Baptist Center over there. Moms bring their babies to, to, to come to the food pantry. And those little, those little children, just little tiny, they can't talk yet, but they can do this. <laughs> you know. I've never seen a mom yet that didn't just swoop them up. You know, she picks them up, and the child stops crying. They stop fretting. They're safe in mom's arm. I don't know what this means, you know, but <laughs> mom does. <laughs> and the, God hears your heart. If that's the sincere desire of your heart, if you'd like for God to pick you up, cry out to him. Tell him, Jesus, save me. Jesus, Pick me up, okay? I can assure you he will. I'm one of those. <laughs> I cried out one day. God blessed me with many abilities and many opportunities. I didn't know where those came from. I thought that was all me. I'm making these good grades, and I'm starting this business, and me, 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 me. That's what I thought. And then God <laughs> said, okay, Richard. <laughs> uh, that's not, how, not exactly how it works here. I'm behind all these blessings you've experienced. All your abilities, all your opportunities, I did that. God, God has, has shown me that now. I enjoyed all that God gave me, but I just didn't acknowledge him. I didn't know. Well, God revealed himself to me. He brought a great big old storm not to hurt me. Okay? That storm was not to hurt me. It was to save me. And I, I know that now. At the time, I didn't understand, but I can, sell, I can tell you now, he, he created that storm to get my attention and to bring me into himself. There's a psalm. He explained it to me a little bit later. God caught me in his net. Folks, if I had a great big old net here, and I'm going to throw it over you, and it falls on you, and now you're all caught up in the net, I would imagine at first you're going to want to struggle and get out of that. Okay? I wouldn't like it one bit. <laughs> but if it's God's net, and he's rescuing you from something the Bible describes as eternal torment, he's rescuing you from something far worse than anything you've ever imagined, the net is going to save you from something horrible. And he's casting that net right here today. If there's anyone that doesn't know him, you've not really made peace with God. You've not really come to know him as your Savior. Today is the day. Thou broughtest us into the net. Thou laidest affliction upon our loins. Sometimes God will use adversity and afflictions of various kinds to bring you into his net so that he can save you. I didn't understand that. Well, today, I'm uh, in his service. Those are some pictures from Western Heights over there. There's Shannon down there on the left in the blue shirt. <laughs> we see a steady flow of people coming through there every week. Uh, 30,000 a year, I'm thinking. 35,000 people a year come through from all over the world. They receive free groceries and clothing. And I get to share Jesus Christ with, with each of them. I get to pray with them. I get to listen to some of the adversity they're experiencing. I've been through a few things myself, so I can connect with them. I can relate. Everything that's happened to me in the past now, God has given it to me so I can connect with somebody else. I can use these things to, to help them to see it's not the end of the world. It might be the end of your life as you know it, but it's the beginning of a new life, a walk with Christ. And that's, I've seen heroin addicts uh, become believers in Christ and be set free. It's, not, it's no problem for God to set people free. Uh, whosoever will call upon him, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That doesn't say you might be. It says you shall be. Okay, that's in Romans chapter 10. 
Well, number four, I've learned about God. He is merciful and he is exceedingly gracious. Mercy and grace. That's a description of my Savior. I offer him to you. If there's anyone here that doesn't know him, call on him today. Let me just open my Bible and read it from Romans chapter 10. Paul here expresses it quite well. Come up here, prayer warriors, all the prayer warriors, and we'll open the altar. And Nathan, where he? Here he is. We might have a, a hymn here, something to uh, give an invitation, and, and we'll, we'll just we'll open the altar. It's open for whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord, or if you have prayer requests of any kind, come. And uh, I love you deeply. I love you very much, and I want to see you in heaven. Uh, Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. With the heart the person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Come.